Cheers. I'm going to need to drink. So, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to see what so happens. I don't know why. I don't know why I agreed to this, Varsha, but uh, here we this are. Is, so. This is why I love Twitter. So all I did was ask <laughs> a, a simple question on Twitter for people who don't know who are joining us why this happened is I asked a simple question. Hey, I'm going to be giving a guest lecture uh, in someone else's class this summer. Should I put it on my CV? And then a friend of mine was like, yes, you should definitely put it on your CV if you're invited. And I was like, no, 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 I'm uninvited. I'm just going to Zoom bomb and like lecture for 75 <laughs> minutes about, about the Cold War. Um, and he's like, but uninvited lectures would be a great, a great CV edition. Uh, and then a friend of the show, Drew McKevin, who's on the show, he's like, I've always wanted to do a podcast where we have, it's called Uninvited Lectures. And we just have people who are not, it's not their special expertise. And they just talk about it. And I was like, yes, let's do it. Uh, and then Matt was like, fine, fuck it, we'll do it. And I was like, yay. <laughs> you know, to yeah, be literally, fair, like, yeah. like uninvited lectures pretty much Peter Abelard's entire career. So like, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's one for the medievalists, you know. I mean, back to the origins of the university, Eleanor, right? Like, yeah, I mean, exactly. it, it, yeah. it probably is the origins of the university are an uninvited lecture, like some mm -hmm. poor cleric <laughs> wandering into a pub saying, let me tell you about Ecclesiastes because you are wrong, <laughs> sir. Exactly. Yeah. From what I know about uh, early modern history, Martin Luther and the Great Reformation is basically a giant uninvited lecture, correct? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That is entirely fair. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Accurate. Yeah. <laughs> like... Long history of uh, posting things on walls that nobody wanted or nobody cared about, right? Yeah. Mm. One of those Twitter memes, like, no one, colon, <laughs> Martin Luther, I have some thoughts. <laughs> it's it's like, I like, numbered like, them like a Twitter thread. So there you yeah, go. Right. Right. I'm going to say, like, like, yeah, you, you know, it's like he's like one out of 99, and that's what yeah. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to get broken oh, at like 45 read. or so, and it's going to get all messed up. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> he's going to forget to thread it wrong, and he's going to he's going to misnumber it at some point. <laughs> and that's and that's why the medievalists come in, or the, you know, the historians come in and say, like, actually, there's not 95 pieces, there's 97. He misnumbered two of them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 See, my preacher who I work on, um, Jan Milge of Kromerzij, uh, you know, common spelling, um, he got arrested once after putting up like his sermon that he was going to give um, on a church in Rome. And they were like, I'm sorry, homeboy, you just like, I'm just not going to let this happen. And he got like um, imprisoned in a Franciscan monastery for like a month until like the Pope was like, you, you got to let him out now. And it always makes me laugh because people always act like, you know, Martin Luther putting this thing up was like some rebellious act. And I was like, no, dude, like everyone shit posted. I don't know what to tell you. And it's like, he's not even one of the exciting ones. His ass didn't even get arrested. You know, like he got thrown in jail. <laughs> No. I mean, his, mm -hmm. history in a moment could swing on a hinge if there was some like Franciscan or Dominican who happened to be walking by while Luther Completely. was doing it. He just like ripped it down. <laughs> just like, no, no, uh -uh. no, uh -uh. I'm gonna <laughs> put a stop to this. You yeah, know? we're done. No mods, <laughs> mods, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I think we should get going. Um, we have we have a, 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 an audience here, so uh, thank you everyone for joining on this us. Uh, joining us joining us on this rogue episode of drinking with historians um thank you to our guests for joining us all uh what's going to happen is i'm going to do just very brief introductions and um of our uh, of our speakers then varsha will kind of explain how we're going to try to to run this um uninvited lectures um event tonight and then we'll just kind of we'll kind of jump right in and we'll we'll see how it goes so but before we do i just wanted to thank rachel again for for pulling everything together um, she is joining us from, as you can see, Philly, um, and um, she is also doing her her part on uh, drinking her um, her beer from, uh, but from across the sea. Um, and so, uh, let me thank her, and then she can kind of fade into the background. And she will be taking any audience questions for our non experts as they are giving their talks today. So, thank you, Rachel. 
Um, all right, so um, I'm just going to go kind of round robin and very briefly, and as opposed to um, a normal episode where I kind of wing the introductions, I actually have something prepared because I didn't want to forget anybody or anything. So um, we'll start with um, Eric Rashway, who is, uh, well, he's directly below me. I don't know where he's on your screen, but um, he is a uh, professor of history at UC Davis, and his recent research focuses on the New Deal and the Second World War. He has a brand new book out with Yale University Press, Why the New Deal Matters, and that was just published, uh, was it last month, Eric? Just a couple oh, weeks ago. Just a couple weeks ago. All right. So mm -hmm. so just at the end of April. So excellent. Um, let's see, uh, going in uh, just random order, John Wyatt Greenlee is a medievalist and cartographic historian. His current project is on the cultural history of eels in medieval England from the 10th through the 17th century, focusing on economic change and the growth of uh, national English identity. Welcome, John. He is also eel historian. He does all the eel stuff on Twitter, basically. So all the eel, stuff. all the eel stuff. <laughs> you think that, that that's like like oh yeah, ha ha ha. He's like no, no. He just, he does all the eel stuff on Twitter. So there you go. All right. Um, staying in the Middle Ages, Eleanor Yanega is a medieval historian specializing in late medieval sexuality, apocalyptic thought, propaganda, the urban experience in general and in Central Europe more specifically. Uh, she has an upcoming book out in just a month, I believe. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, That's the right. Middle uh, Ages. Third, Go third ahead, of June, please. sorry, tell your friends. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> Order like no Icon Books. Uh, Middle, the Middle Ages, a graphic history, um, a really wonderful looking book. Um, she's been featured on History Today. She has her own uh, TV show um, on, um, on History Hit, I believe it is, right? Yes, yep. called Going Medieval, which is also her Twitter. Twitter handle as, as well. So. And last but absolutely not least is Annabelle Labrec. Um, she's a second year PhD student at uh, UC Berkeley, Go Bears, uh, studying Go Bears. North American history uh, with an emphasis on indigenous history. Um, her research focuses on the significance of salt in understanding the indigenous power and Euro-American colonization. She also serves as a Native American studies host on the New Books Network a consortium of author interview podcast channels dedicated to raising the level of public discourse by introducing scholars and other serious writers to wide public via new media. So we have a wide variety of specialties here, and I will turn it over to Varsha now to explain what we're going to do. Yeah, so basically Matt has a box or a hat, a witch's hat full of topics based on- It is a Union your... Cavalry officer's hat, Varsha. Thank you. <laughs> Um, which is, based on everyone's expertise, a bunch of topics. I have a Tupperware bowl of everyone's names. And so basically Matt will pull a topic out. I will pull a hat out. Um, as long as you're not the expert in that topic, you will be given you know, a few minutes to talk extrem extemporaneously about it. Uh, and then uh, if the audience has questions about your amazing lecture, they can ask those questions. Uh, and then we will turn it to the actual expert who can add any um, insights if they need to. Uh, I'm assuming the lecture will be perfect anyway. They won't need to add insights, but they can add insights if they need to. Uh, and then we'll, we'll keep going. Um, hopefully this is fun for people and yeah. for people in the audience. So yeah, that's drinking with historians today. Yeah, I mean, pretty much this is just gonna be like you're teaching at a small liberal arts college, like an adjunct there, yeah. right? Like yeah. you're gonna have to lecture on something that you know nothing about. So. And, and someone's asked you to teach something that you don't know anything about. It's, Absolutely. It's, that's what's gonna happen, yeah. That's so happen. should we begin yeah. that? I think we should begin. All right, so I have I have a list of names. I will hold it up to the to the screen to make sure that nobody thinks there's any shenanigans going on and we're just uh, you abusing our power, which we absolutely are. But um, but that's okay. All right, so mixing them up. Here we go. Uh, let's do. All right, I have one here. And the topic is salty bitches resource extraction in America. All right, so Annabelle is okay. obviously excluded from this round. So it'll yes. be one of the okay. others. Uh, we have Eleanor, Eleanor uh. Yanega. So Eleanor, you get to go first. Okay, so you know, like I'd, I'd like to point out, first of all, you can't call it salty bitches and then act like I'm not an expert, but you know, that's, <laughs> lucky for you, you've got a colon there. Um, I mean, so I suppose resource extraction in America, one of the first things that you can always say and preface this is that mm, the colonial experience, right? <laughs> because it's like the entire history of both of the Americans, the, of the Americas, the moment white people show up was like, seems like you have some resources, be a shame if someone 
extracted them, right? <laughs> so you have like, it's also a really interesting thing because people tend to act like when they look at, for example, modern European culture that uh, we sort of had like coffee and chocolate around the shop. You know, yeah. people don't like to even consider the idea that like potatoes are not from here, right? So it's not just necessarily like the out and out extraction of things as well. It's the extraction of, you know, things that you can grow. It's the extraction of lives in a lot of ways as well, when we think about the history of Americas. Um, so when we kind of start beginning to talk about this and like the way that indigenous populations were treated and stuff as well, because it's also just like, look at the very way that white people contacted America and began to extract indigenous people. Look at the story of Pocahontas and consider the fact that she died here in London, right? So the entire way that we even treat history, which is sort of like looking at the written word or looking at the way the world works in this very specific and oftentimes kind of like European gaze is just about like taking those things and making them palatable or useful or interesting to a white audience. Um, so it, it's difficult to even know where to start with this uh, as a result of this. <laughs> you know, like, I don't even know what to say. Like, I'm just like, yeah, that sounds like all of it, you know? And I mean, and sometimes it, it's like the extraction of resources or the extraction of lives and then replacing it with other resources and lives that we also see as, um, you know, expendable or you know, only useful if it's going to lead towards the extraction of other goods. Um, so yeah, the entire modern history of the Americas is about that. And um, you know, we like to pretend that it's about like uh, free association ideas here of like liberty or chances. And it's like, no, white people just be stealing shit. Um, so, <laughs> like, and I mean, that, that's what I have to say about it, I guess. <laughs> Annabelle, oh, I think you. Eleanor has Excellent. written your yes. whole dissertation for you. Um, no, you I, think add that I think that that's like a better perspective that I take. I take like a very like rudimentary, like this is how you extract salt from salt water and white people weren't smart enough to figure this out. So they had to learn from people who they think couldn't do it themselves. I like this, I, this kind of like large, like more like meta analysis of like, when white people are extracting salt, what else are they extracting? I think that that's good. I think I'm gonna improve my work with that. Thank you, Elsa. <laughs> you know, just feel free to use white people be stealing shit as like the colon for your things. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So First it's like- on salt, white people steal things part 495. Yeah, exactly. Like... <laughs> and wait, Annabelle, I have a quick question to to make this uh, a little bit more serious, but not too serious. What century do you work on? When when are they extracting the salt? When are Americans or not Americans, white people finally learning this? Well, right now I'm looking at like the late, mid to late 18th century, um, but I've also looked at the 1540s and the 1680s, kind of a comparison between Spanish and French colonization and how they interact with salt resources and kind of, use or try to co-opt indigenous knowledge about salt making and salt resources in order to extract it for at like much larger quantities. Because Europeans, you know, they love preserving things like pork and fish in like massive quantities of salt. Um, so it is, and you know, when they carry out these massive military campaigns to take control of other resources, they give troops things like salted pork and salted fish to take on the way. So. It's like this cycle of we need salt to go get more resources so we can take more stuff from you. So show us where it is so we can take it. I, based on that, I think Eleanor did a pretty good job. I, I, I would yeah. have to, yeah, yeah. Like I said, as long I as like I don't have to give it, analysis. as long as there's no facts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so should we go to the next lecture, Matt? Yeah, I think so. I think we, we did actually make a mistake, as um, Rachel is pointing out, is that we forgot oh. to ask what everybody is drinking. So, um, mm -hmm. so Varsha, do you want to do you want to kick us off about what, what you're drinking tonight? Yeah, I'm having a Hibiki Japanese Harmony. It is a really, really good Japanese whiskey. Um, it's really smooth um, and uh, everyone should try it. Yes. 
Excellent. Yeah. Um, I myself, I have uh, some Larceny uh, bourbon, which um, is just absolutely delicious. I was going to make a fancy cocktail, but like this didn't call for fancy cocktails. This calls for just straight up whiskey. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing tonight. So uh, let's see. Um, Eleanor, please, since you were, you're doing your part to, to be drinking um, per Boris Johnson's order. So I am. I am. So, you know, earlier because uh, Boris Johnson told me I have to drink 124 pints for the country it's the only time i've ever listened to boris johnson um so like i've moved on from that but um, i'm now enjoying a rob roy um we are using jura tonight i believe as the whiskey and it is black cherry bitters is what it seems like is in this one my long-suffering boyfriend will probably give me a new one shortly she says <laughs> that's right we have an audience in which you you formally requested that so, mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. um eric how about you um, well, I feel rebuked since you said this wasn't the cocktail occasion uh, there, Matt, but this is a, this is a, a jungle bird, which is one of the uh, traditional exotic cocktails uh, made with uh, lime juice, pineapple juice, Campari, and in this case, Putters, Pusser's British Navy Rum. So. Oh, fantastic. Ooh, okay, all right. I remember having a very brief conversation at the end of our, our when you were last on about um, uh, tiki drinks. So I assume that this is this is part of that, correct? This is indeed uh, part of part of that. Whatever that thing is, this is part of it. <laughs> <laughs> that whole that whole tiki thing. So yeah. yeah, excellent. All right, John, how about you? I'm drinking scotch. I'm drinking Laphroaig, um, nice. which is I have it on good authority from a dear friend of mine that it tastes like old band aids, but I love it dearly. So they you. are incorrect. There's a definite what? iodine flavor there. No, look, it tastes like a delicious seaweed fire. Okay. Exactly. Oh, it's like, good. Yeah. It's good iodine. I'm not knocking the iodine. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm fighting your friend. Give me his uh, or her address or their address. What? I'm coming over. <laughs> Once I brought Lafroig to a party and Ardbeg. I bought two Isla scotches to a grad student party and. Both these scotches were rebuked by my friends. They were like, Barsha, this tastes like sucking on charcoal. And I'm like, excuse me. Well, then you can't suck on my charcoal. Good for you. Sorry for First you. of all, what it tastes like is peat. That, we all know this, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Look, some people also, just don't deserve nice things, OK? Yeah. Like, That's true. So that is absolutely it, correct. Yeah. That is also way fancier that a graduate started party than I ever attended when I went to <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So. <laughs> Things have really, okay. really kind of escalated since since I was yeah. there. I mean, granted, it was it was the '90s. It was a different time. So, and sorry, and I, Annabelle, how about how about yourself? What yeah. are you drinking today? Well, I'm drinking on a graduate student's budget, but I'll show you my my budget bottle of Samuel Grant. I'm, I'm nice. about halfway through it. Um, that's all I could muster. I didn't have anything nicer than that. <laughs> that's great. I mean, sometimes you don't really need anything nicer than that. So. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the semester, no, it does. Mm -hmm. does yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, like Eric, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, I mean, there's there's different ways to kind of celebrate things. Sometimes it's a straight whiskey. Sometimes it, it deserves a cocktail. And I think those are those are both absolutely um, you know ways that you, that that you can move forward. So, all right. So should we move on to the next topic? Yeah. And um, Let's Eleanor, do it. you can relax, and now you can just heckle people. So, yeah. Uh, finally, you know, something yeah. that rewards my talents. That's right. All right. Right in your wheelhouse. <laughs> so the next topic is, damn, environmental history in the United States. Okay. This is going to be good. Um, okay. So who we have is John, John Wyatt. All right. Let's talk about dams. Dams in the, in the United States, right? Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, well, so, so this piggybacks a little bit on what Eleanor was talking about resource extraction, because that's essentially what a dam is. It's extracting resources, right? It's extracting electricity, using water, and sort of destroying a ton of natural resources in order to do it. Um, I grew up in Utah, uh, which relies really heavily on a system of, of dams and, and, and water saving mechanisms to let people live in the middle of what's basically a desert, right? Um, Utah is sort of at the upper end of the Colorado, um, and this is a long series of, of dams. And, uh, you know, we in, in the middle part of the last century, we looked to, to dams a lot as sort of what seemed like a pretty environmentally friendly means of extracting electricity from the environment, right? Um, it's not fossil fuels, it's just turbines turning, it's, it's great. But 
you know, dams have an enormous number of ecological uh, problems, right? They're all the downstream water coming off the bottom of dams. If they're if they're bottom deep, is way too cold for fish to live in. Um, fish can't get back upstream. I I work with uh, studying eels and eels. There aren't eels in the Western United States, but eels have real problems <laughs> with dams, and so do salmon and all kinds of other things, right? Um, you have to build eel ladders and salmon passes and things like that, and they're not terribly efficient. Um, setting on top of that, dams destroy sort of canyon environments that are built in. So sometimes they flood uh, they flood uh, towns too. So um, you sort of as a as a governmental policy when you're you're deciding where to put a dam and when and why, one of the things that you're having to decide is who's getting displaced or what's getting displaced and whether or not you care. Um, I did my master's at uh, East Tennessee State University in uh, Johnson City, and, and I did uh, river guiding on the Watauga River, which came out of the bottom of uh, the Watauga Dam. Um, and when they built that, they flooded the town of Butler, and um, and they uh, they actually jacked up most of the houses in Butler and put them on the back of trucks and moved them like four miles up the road to the town, put them back down again to the town of New Butler. But um, the remains are still there. <laughs> I'm sorry, Americans are wild. They're like, we'll call it New Butler. <laughs> like, <okay. laughs> They, they they were yeah they were a little crazy but you know we we we, we deal with them um and so for for all that dams don't produce fossil fuel pollution and things like that they're still just sort of wildly problematic as a means of of uh, of creating energy um and i think the real the, the push to build dams with the united states and europe over the last 50 plus years i think is really going to be a lasting legacy in terms of the environmental damage that we have done um both to sort of uh fish and wildlife and the stream beds and topology and all kinds of things so that's what i got Hun dams hundred percent so far in my opinion mainly because like you're right john uh dams uh destroyed a lot of the rivers in the american west um, but one thing that I would also add that you sort of touched on is the, the legacy, right? And so depending on the type of environmental historian you talk to, but, you know, most of them sort of agree, there's this like uh, intimate connection between like the rise of like this type of business and the rise of, of the growth of like states like California uh, with, you know, the rise of government policies and government institutions like, you know, the Bureau of Reclamation and everything. So not only is there a story of like environmental degradation and displacement, but there's also a story of, you know, the rise of business, the rise of, of government um, protection, the rise of not just government protection, but like government regulation and huge institutions, which is something that Eric also knows about when you, when you talk about the New Deal, because his book does correctly mention the TVA as important, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a, that was a pretty good lecture. I like how you just mentioned all the rivers that you've been to. That was great. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> You I know, wanted I can't to just think like, oh, sorry. I just wanted to go, also wanted to bring it back up to me, obviously. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, please, please do. And so, because well, I'm from Washington State, and uh, we have a lot of hydroelectric jams as well. And uh, one of the big problems that we had with it as well is um, what it means in terms of the displacement of the culture of Native people. So yeah. like for us, like salmon and like you know ruining salmon runs and stuff is also kind of like a huge cultural issue with our native people um because like you know just everything everything in washington like is just connected to salmon and so when you block a river or something like that and you stop the flow of salmon and you know they put fish ladders in it's it does no, there's just have, no way there's just no way fish and ladders have so, about like, a 25 to 30 percent efficacy rate so they're not great <laughs> Yeah, and it, it's great. like, it's just, it's horrid, you know, and it, it's something that, you know, I've been aware of my whole life, and I just, you know, justice for the Native people, that's all I have to say, I'm just, I will never be, yeah. not be mad about it, Yeah, that's That's another part that's, like, really interesting about the American West, is if you go back to the early 20th century, um, there are very, there are certain regions in the American West that start fighting over water rights, especially, like, white settlers versus Native Americans, and that's the point where Native Americans become, like, wards of the federal government so oddly enough the federal government is like yeah you know what these people are on federal government lands therefore they do have a right to water and then the white settlers are like excuse you uh no they don't and then so for the rest of the 20th century there's like white settlers or yeah white settlers um basically state governments who are fighting with the federal government to like get water back and so that's another big story about dams too and then a bunch of native american reservations even though they want dams like smaller dams to make sure to you know to irrigate to produce electricity they're not able to get the funding of it so like the story of dams is like especially in the american west it's the best the best story great story mm -hmm. 
Can I ask a, a naive question? I mean, I'm the I'm the student who sits in the front and pays a lot of attention, but like is totally <laughs> lost. So, um, so John, were there were there? You mentioned like eel ladders. Like, so yeah. was that is that like a thing too? Like, are, were there dams in medieval Europe? Yes. Yeah, there are actually quite a lot of them. Um, and starting in about a thousand or so, sort of increasingly uh, a big number of them. It's a big part of the reason why um, medieval English people, especially, but in Europe too, start, uh, there's a real change in how they're eating fish around a thousand. They stop eating a lot of inland fish and start, or sort of freshwater fish, and start having to go fish further and further out to sea. Um, it's called the fish event horizon, which is a fantastic term. Um, amazing. And, That's amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's so, going to stick with me. All right. Yeah. So they're, they're, <laughs> the fish they're building these... horizon or fe, as we call it in the <laughs> So they're building all these dams for mills, right? And so all those mills in the doomsday book are almost all attached to dams. And that, that gets in the way of most migratory fish, um, not actually eels at that point. They keep eating a lot of eels because the eels can travel over land and they can get around medieval dams pretty easily. Big modern dams don't work for them, but the the earlier dams they can manage. Wow, okay. I did not know that. That is good That's to fantastic. know. That's fantastic. So, I mean, I just, yeah. I'm about to be saying, yeah, I'm saying that all <laughs> the time. I'm gonna pretend like I knew that. I'm really excited right. about Fish <laughs> Event Horizon. The Fish I'm Event excited. Horizon. Where's that movie? <laughs> 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 like a haunted medieval dam at about one year 1000 that that opens a portal to another dimension right so yeah it'd be amazing. So, it's like we someone call we michael bay get onto our agent that's right on now. yeah at some point i have to ask the medievalist did you see the new dave patel movie trailer for the green knight or whatever it is girl did i have i seen anything other than that repeatedly <laughs> 20 times a day so i mean i'm looking respectfully that's yeah. <laughs> That's all. That's so you know. Okay. So it looks amazing. All right. So we got to move on. Yeah. Great. Okay. Next. 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 Uh, let's see. Oh well, this is this is a perfect follow-on. Eels and animals in history. Okay. Okay. Eric. Eric. <laughs> eels. Well, apart from the fact that once hovercraft is full of them, what can I say about eels? <laughs> Um, what I know about <laughs> eels and animals generally in history is that, of course, eels are significant because um, they uh, were used as currency, which I mostly know because I follow John on Twitter. So this, is my, <laughs> this is my principal subject, uh, as you know, is money in history. One of the great problems with a money supply is whether or not the sovereign has control of it, right? And so the sovereign has control of the supply nowadays, as we would say, of fiat money. But in the old days, you had a problem if you had a gold standard, or in the case of the Middle Ages, eels, because rents were calculated in eels and people were obliged to pay uh, an eel rent, as I believe it was known, um, in order to to maintain a sort of residence upon their lands or commerce or business. I don't know whether there were eel tolls on canals or pay roads or whether there was eel tithing. That is not a thing that I know particularly about or indeed whether eels were useful for other purposes. Although I know Eleanor's neighbors will put them in pies because right. you cannot stop the British people from putting anything revolting in a pie. That is one of their favorite practices along You're with welcome. of course consuming 42 pints a week. So so my, my what my about it? understanding, therefore, of, of, of eels is, as we say of money, it has to be a unit of exchange and a store of value. I find it hard to imagine that eels are useful as a store of value because I imagine they go off like most fish, as they say, after about three days. However, as a unit of exchange, I'm aware that they were in use. Now, if you want to look at the broader topic of animals in history. Of course, this is a much bigger subject, and I doubt that we have, uh, you know, the, the full the full time that, uh, that we would like to a lot to that here. But since we started with resource extraction, of course, we know that um, agriculture is vitally important throughout most of y'all's period. I'm outnumbered by the medievalists here, I'm pretty sure, throughout most of all, most of y'all's period and that uh, what we mostly know is that agriculture through the Middle Ages was pursued by peasants um, who uh, were uh, also known as serfs uh, in the point break uh, of history, which comes shortly after the fish event 
horizon. So um, the mastery of uh, uh, surfing and eels is clearly a vital innovation in the uh, development of the medieval period. I think I'd better stop now. <laughs> I think I can't, when you said they were like, were there eel toll roads? Like I can imagine like somebody driving up on their cart, like throwing an eel into the basket. And then Here's my cruel oh, full yeah. of eels, sir. I demand that you let me pass. <laughs> so John, that was clearly an amazing lecture. Uh, did you have anything to add to that? <laughs> I think that, 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 John's like, no notes. No notes. <laughs> no, I should probably just quit and give you the title of eel historian right now, I think. Um, no, that was really quite good. So uh, a couple I, I demand to be called an honorary eel scholar. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, so we'll find somebody to endow a chair of it. Um, <laughs> Right, so a, a couple of things about that, I guess. Um, there were, in fact, eel tolls, um, mostly uh, at walls yes. going into cities, um, uh, where uh, London, you London, just chuck and them Bristol... over the wall, like just there you go. There's no, no, no. When you when you went through the gate, you had to had to pay. If you had a wagon full of eels, you had to pay one stick of them to the city, which was twenty five eels. Um, so there were, in fact, tolls. There are also a couple of examples I have of people um, who were arrested and sued for uh, charging tolls, illegally charging tolls of eels for people crossing their land. So it was, in fact, a thing that happened. Um, you're right that eels will go bad, and actually they go bad faster than other fishes, uh, other fish, because uh, they're <laughs> largely fat. They have a huge amount of fat, um, and so they go bad in about a day. But if you smoke them, use a cold smoking process that takes a couple of months to do, and then your eels can last about a year. So uh, the big uh, eel, the big eel rents that are getting paid to monasteries of like 20, 30, 40,000 eels, they're getting paid right before Lent, and they're sort of sticking them in a the cellar and using them to eat during fish days throughout the year. Um, wow. So, and I don't And that's why they're so horny, the because like eels and the aphrodisiac. Yeah. yeah, right. No, ab yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the distaff gospels tell us that, right? That, uh, that, that, uh, that eating eels will make young women fall on their backs. Mm -hmm. Wait, is that real? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it I, I wasn't, sorry, I wasn't making that up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is also true that British people will put them in pies. Isn't that correct? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And still, there's also, even, even still. Yeah, yep. there, and there is also like the whole jelly deal thing. Um, I'm an eel, I'm an eel apologist. So I love eel. It's it's delicious and fatty. I'm more freshwater, less saltwater. I They're think the same that like well, so the so I mean eels are born the, the freshwater eels are born in the sea, come to land, live most of their lives in land, and then go back to sea to die. So they're both fresh and salt water. Um, mm. It just depends on when you catch them. I guess yeah. I feel like. Um, you know, more Washington based stories because I like I grew up working in sushi houses as is like normal in Washington state. And so like I'm more of an Unagi girl and less of an Anago girl. Because I always yes. feel like Anago, but when they're caught in the salt water, they are less fatty and I like the more fatty quality. So, but I don't like jelly deals. So I'm like sushi, yes, pie, fine, jelly deal. No. British people, I love your pints. <laughs> My way also, John, as long as we're eeling it up here. Yeah. Isn't eel sex or wasn't eel sex until relatively recently slightly a mystery of the, uh, for the Yeah, biology? it still actually yeah. is. We haven't haven't seen it happen. Um, and with European and American eels, we're pretty, we think it happens in the Sargasso Sea, but we don't really know. Um, nobody's seen it happen. Uh, the closest we can get is like, we've tagged eels. I haven't, but so other people, other people know what they're doing of tagged eels and uh, traced them fairly close to the Sargasso Sea. And that's where they found the smallest baby eels, but nobody's actually seen eels have sex. Um, so what you're eels, saying is that eels are the only category of thing that's immune to rule 34. <laughs> <laughs> and yet people she, still use them as phallic metaphors all the time. So you know what, like you could try asking them nicely, you know, like, <laughs> but, but it's curves. actually, but, <laughs> but that's part of what made them so uh, useful for eating during Lent and fish days because the medieval people thought that they were asexual because they oh. never saw them have said, we haven't either. They thought that they reproduced some sort of spontaneous way of rubbing themselves on rocks and rubbing off Immaculate little bits of new conception eels or something. Exactly. And so like during Lent, you're supposed to not eat foods that remind you of sex. And so fish don't remind you of sex as much as like cows, apparently. 
Just what? Try me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, hey, that, that's 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 Thomas Aquinas talking. That's not me. Um, that man. And, uh, but eels don't have sex at all if you're a medieval person, and so like they're great. They don't have anything to do with sex. They just like poof, new eel. So yeah. So they're the perfect Lenten food, really. Mm, mm. Okay. So we have one more lecture, right, Matt? Yeah, so, yeah, I learned so much there. Thank you <laughs> both. Um, <laughs> so we know Annabelle is going to be going to be our, our last, uh, but certainly not least speaker. And so let's see what, what we have here. Um, all right. Sorry. The government is here to help you, FDR. <laughs> <is here. laughs> okay, Annabelle, I know you've taught... Uh, the first half of the U.S. survey, but I don't know if you've taught the second half, so this is going to be fun. Yeah, I have. Hmm, okay. All right, so there was a depression, and no one had money, <laughs> <laughs> and the banks fucked everything up, and the rich people also did, so then all of this stuff happened, and everyone was like, okay, I need all of these resources. I need, like, food and a job, and... A, a road to walk on to my job that I don't have and my kids need all of these things and also I would like some water so everyone is really stressed out in the early 1930s because no one has any money because all of the rich capitalists ruined everything for everyone so then FDR comes in and he's like actually we've been looking at the government all wrong and we have this dumbass Coolidge Harding I don't know who it was we have this dumbass who was in <laughs> couldn't help anyone and was like actually you're on your own well guess not you guess what you're not on your own and I'm gonna put in all of these acronyms which I don't know what any of them mean except for the Tennessee Valley Authority and the WPA the Works Progress Administration that's as far as my knowledge goes um but I have this list of like 150 acronyms and if you just pick like four you can get like four things that you need and it'll help you get up on your feet and so he puts this whole program in place and everyone is like, oh yeah, like the government is helping me a lot and this is really great. Except it wasn't for everyone and not everyone was being helped by this. The government can help you. So like black communities were completely marginalized by a bunch of these acronyms that weren't helping them specifically. But there were also indigenous communities who were working their way towards gaining citizenship rights after being wards of the state. And there was this big upending of, of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and all of this stuff and everything is changing. And then all of a sudden World War II happens. And that's the new deal and the government helps you now. Oh my God, and also social security, something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> And regulations on the government. There's, there's no regulations on the banks. What the banks can do. Yes. That's the new deal. And everything. And the acronyms, too. Don't you are so ready for comps next year, Annabelle. <laughs> I just have to learn all of the acronyms, and yeah, then I've got it. <laughs> so, so, Eric, besides this amazing history of acronyms, do you want anything to add about... Um, government helping us. fucking nailed it. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean you know, but like, I think where, is, was, where is, is the lie? You know, exactly. Where is the lie? Wait, have I frozen? Yeah. Yes. Wait, there I'm you back. You're back. Okay. You're back. Cool. Um, yeah, well, I was thinking that, you know, uh, between uh, Eleanor's uh, history of sexuality and John's histories of eels, you've already got the nude eel covered. So you really don't need me oh God, oh uh, no. here to do this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that joke, no. that joke. <laughs> so, oh. You've been saving that one, haven't you? <laughs> oh, how long have you been working oh, on that one? Come on. <laughs> He's been Good night, everybody. That That's the end. Just kicking any better than that. <laughs> oh, no, that was fantastic. I think, look, you know, you, you, were, you were right that the... Uh, there's nothing worse for capitalism than capitalists was, I think, your summary of the Great Depression. And so that was that was that fantastic. Sure. And uh, yes, um, Roosevelt uh, rolled in. So we've looked in the whole gov government thing. So all wrong. And um, in fact, uh, democracy is good. And I can prove it by showing you that uh, we can do stuff to help people, as you say. You remind me when you said, you know, about needing the job and the, the school and whatever the road to walk on. There was a 
there was a joke about uh, you know, the New Deal in the South that was uh, commonly told about, you know, the, the sort of the school teacher at the New Deal built school catechize, catechizing the children. So children, who built this schoolhouse? And the children would say as one, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then they would say, children, who built the road that comes to the school? And they would say, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then you'd say, who built the dam? Yes, there were dams that provide electricity to the school. And they would say, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then they would say, children, who made you? And there was this long silence. And then one child stood up in the back of the room and said, God. And then the other, another child said, throw that sorry Republican out of here. <laughs> um, so, you know, yes, New Deal did these things. I think it is important. You are correct, of course, that the Democratic Party of the 1930s being a Jim Crow party in the South, it's important to say, as you say, that uh, Black people were left out of many Jim New Deal programs. It's also important to note, however, that it is because of the New Deal that black people become Democrats. We should not neglect to listen to the voices of black people in the 1930s who said, you know what? As crappy as Democrats in the South are, Democrats in the North and the West are better. And we are going to move there and take those jobs, right? And the, the WPA was, was a very good employer for black folks particularly. Um, and, you know, as you say, the Indian New Deal, so-called, is a, is a rather a mixed bag, and we don't have time for the ways in which that is true. But there was such a thing, so it's good to point that out. So, so you know, full marks, I sign off on your comps. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, okay, so uh, before, instead of just spoiling your book, because obviously we should have people buy Eric's book, Why the New Deal Matters, why, one quick sentence, why does the New Deal matter today? Well, the New Deal matters for Two reasons. Number one, it is ubiquitous in ways that you don't even think about. I mean, if you have ever interacted with the financial system, for example, if you've had a bank account, if you've handled the currency, you have interacted with a new deal. FDIC. Right. Social Security doesn't just embrace old age pensions, but also disability insurance and unemployment insurance and many other forms of small s, small s social security, right? The other reason, though, apart from its ubiquity, is the New Deal was a program to restore people's faith in democracy at a time when it was under threat, right? More than a program to recover from the depression, it was a program to show Americans that recovery from the depression could benefit, you know, the vast bulk of Americans and not just rich people. And don't forget, this is at a time, as, as you say, Annabelle, when, you know, fascism is on the rise throughout the world and there's a threat of, you know, fascist movements in the United States. And that's Roosevelt's chief concern is to try to say, look, you know, we have a democracy. It may be really lousy in certain parts, but we at least have a democracy and it's worth kind of moving forward with the democracy thing rather than going over to the fascist side. So that's the important thing to remember about the New Deal. Okay. What about all the, ac why were there so many acronyms though, Eric? <laughs> You know, that's like, it's like a college orientation meeting, like my HR training when I got here, it's like they gave me a freaking list of all the acronyms that they named and I still 15 years later at Virginia Tech, like I still, I still have a master's. When you, when you tell the students that there was both the Public Works Administration or the PWA and the Works Progress Administration or the WPA, <laughs> usually you've lost them right there. That's the name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have time for one more lecture. Matt, can I give a lecture on horny nuns? Because I've been thinking about horny nuns for a while. Well, so I was, wow. I was gonna say- That makes like, all have, of us. <laughs> we have two more topics and we, so, so yeah, why don't you go ahead and then um, the only other one is, is my topic, which is filling in the name of religion. Um, so, but you can do horny nuns and then I'm happy, like you guys can pick something for me and I'll do it. So I've okay. had enough to drink, so whatever. There right we now. go. Okay, so what I know about horny nuns. nuns is, yeah, so what I know is that back in the Middle Ages, you know, in the old days, they, you know, they really, they the hate The olden times, like, Varsha, the, the olden, olden times. times. Yes. The dark Eels. ages, they, Eels. they, yeah. Thank you. They really don't <laughs> like sex. Like, you know, they, they consider, like, especially all these Catholics, this is before the Protestant Reformation, all they're thinking about is how do we make it so the only time people think about sex is after they're married and when they have to have their, like, their allotted 10 kids, right? Famously, so, Protestants love sex. By yeah. the way, the Protestants love it. They're just like, yeah, just ask a Puritan. They're like, that's my <laughs> thing. I like sex, yeah. so. Hey, come on, they, they probably <laughs> did. Um, okay, so. You gotta, you gotta make more Protestants somehow, you know. Yeah, exactly. So we've set the stage. It's because here. they're rubbing on rocks. Didn't you listen to John? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Okay, so we're setting the stage here. So, you know, Catholics, especially in England, um, uh, but also in France and all these different places, they hate sex. So um, another thing they believe, uh, what I understand about Christianity, especially the, the Catholic faith, is that they read Genesis and they come out of it thinking, okay, Eve is a bitch. Like she is the reason all of this has happened, you know? So women are like the real problem here. And so Shocker. you're a woman in the Middle Ages and you don't, you know, you don't get married at like, you know, the old age of 12. They like, they send you off to a nunnery. And so you're at this nunnery and, you know, you're not allowed to think about sex. All you're thinking about is like, you know, you're married to Jesus. Like, that's what you're focused on. You're married to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and to God. And obviously the problem is just like, you know, in early 20th century England, when like all these parents were like, oh, we don't want our sons to be gay. So they sent them to like boarding schools with other sons. You know, when you're sending a bunch of women to become nuns with other women, obviously, you know, things are going to come out of that situation. Um, and, you know, as we know from our ninth grade biology class, you know, everybody goes through puberty. So like all these nuns at certain points in their lives are like, you know, wait, what, what does it mean to be married? What does it mean to be in love with Jesus? And then instead of, you know, falling in love with Jesus, they, you know, start planning orgies with each other. And I think the, the fascinating thing about this is it's not just, you know, great content for for historians to like put out to the public it's uh it's a really cool way to think about how did priests try to stop this and and then they couldn't because priests themselves were probably you know thinking about sex as well so yeah i think that the the reason i find this interesting as someone who is not catholic and as someone who does not study medieval history but as someone who is lecturing uh, on this right now is um sex is just a really ubiquitous ubiquitous part of medieval history but no one thinks about it because everyone's just thinking about people dying from the plague and like you know how dark it is and stuff so that man i should teach so, medieval history that was great so it's like <laughs> it's like the new deal then right it's ubiquitous yeah. and nobody yes, thinks it's about the new it deal, but for sex. Right. it's the new deal but for sex and christianity right. it. it's mostly just historians and paul Ver verhoeven like that's what that's it those are the people who are fascinated by this yes absolutely. you know yeah. Okay, right. Eleanor, what right. did I get wrong Eleanor. besides everything? Well, I mean, you, you didn't say Paul Verhoeven, so, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I just, I want to just, like, shout out to my boy. I'd like to celebrate his whole, you know, library, his whole works. Showgirls is my favorite movie ever. The Forbidden Verhoeven. We, get, we don't have time for all that. I'll give a lecture on that another time. I am prepared for that. Um, okay, so a couple of notes. <laughs> Just a couple of notes here. The average age of marriage in the medieval period is the in the twenties. People got married Wait, in really? twenties. Yes. Oh wow. Um, okay. People don't actually die at thirty-two in the medieval period. That's an average lifespan. And when half of all Eleanor, people, but but nobody bathed. Nobody bathed. Yeah, nobody right? bathed. Uh, nobody no bathed. one bathed. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, Everybody like, stank. Uh, just Everybody stank all the time, yeah. and yeah, that was so. Yeah, the average person in the medieval period gets married in their twenties. One of the things that skews our view on this is that we pay attention to royal marriages, and people will get married at a very early age when they're royal or they're noble in order to make, you know, political statements. Um, but I hate to break it to you, not everybody is like you know the Dauphin of France. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> actually, eighty percent of everybody is a peasant, um, and so on and so forth. Now, having said that, most nuns do not come necessarily from peasant families. When you join um, a nunnery, a lot of people join nunneries actually um, after even they've been married. So it's really common, for example, for older people to retire to nunneries and monasteries, like when they're fucking sick of each other and their kids are grown, they'll be like, okay, shake hands, I'll see you later. So and they've experienced like, the world of carnal pleasure yeah. and then they join. Yeah. And then, you know, a lot, a big way that a lot of people kind of come in is as oblates. So say that you are from a more well-to-do family and they've just got a lot of kids around the joint. They'll say, okay, like, look, we got to get rid of one of these daughters because mm -mm, like, we're not going to be able to afford all these dowries. So what you do is you send them off to the nunnery. You still have to kind of pay for that. It's not like, you know, nuns are not necessarily like just taking any child off the street. So you kind of like, that'll come along a lot of the time with sort of like a gift of money that will put them up. Right. So eels. Or eels. Yeah, like or eels. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Sorry, it all eels. comes back. It, it just it all it's comes all back. back. It so, all does, any, really. so there's there's kind of like a, a range of experiences 
in a nunnery, right? So there, there are some kids who've like grown up there and they, they, they've basically been there since they were like eight or something like that. There are people who kind of like, mm, yeah, okay, I guess I'm gonna join in their 20s. You'll have particular groups of nuns, for example, like the Magdalens that are made up almost entirely of uh, penitential sex workers. Um, although then they just become a normal group of nuns, uh, you know, and things like I that. I mean, so were they normal of group of nuns or were they running a brothel that we don't know about? Well, you know, uh, see my PhD thesis, uh, Jan Milchevich, <laughs> she said they were Charles the Fourth for more for more information on that one. Um, but so the, you've got like a range of women who have like a range of experiences, and the thing about people is, I don't know if you met them, but they be horny. So, uh, <laughs> like, wait, that, wait, 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 stop. I know. Are, I know. People I had know. sex in the past? I, I know. Uh, and, and one of the, the things that is quite interesting about the medieval period is like one of the ways that they relate to religious is through this really ecstatic kind of um, oh, uh, ideal. Yeah. So, you know, and yeah, like, for example, nuns are married to Jesus. And so we'll have like lots of um, really great firsthand accounts. They'll be like, yeah. And then Jesus came off the cross and we made out and he gave me <laughs> an engagement ring that was his foreskin. And then we just kind of did hand stuff. And like, <laughs> And you know, like, and then everyone is like, "Damn, girl, you're a visionary." You know, like, <laughs> and they're like, give the, "Like, give that girl a sinkhood." Oh my god! You know, we have the, there's like nuns who are horny for each other. Like, we got lots of like horny. We got a lot of hot horny nun on nun love letters where they're like, "Girl, I'd be thinking about your little titties. They're great. Miss you lots. XOXO. That's not a joke." This is that's just paraphrasing. Like yeah. I'm serious here. I, I believe the actual the actual phrase is when I think about um, the way you held my little breasts, I want to die, which is like so god. Like it's so emo. It's just like perfect. oh god, I love them so much. Um, but then you also have people who, for example, like Joan of Leeds, who was a nun, and my girl just um, R U N N O F T uh, because she was like quite horny by all accounts, and she left like a fake dummy in her bed and pieced out to like go <laughs> screw some guy, and there was like a manhunt for her. They were like, we got an APB out on a horny nun. They were like. <laughs> And they never found my girl. Like she was just like, they never found her. They never, no, she was just gone. Like she was just gone. So like, um, my point is that um, being in a nunnery is a land of contrasts. There's a lot of ways to be horny. Uh, you know, you could be, you could be religiously ecstatic horny. You could be like just, you know, trad lesbian horny. Or you could be Eloise, like writing love letters to Abelard and be like, remember when we used to fuck though? That was great. RIP your <laughs> penis. Um, you know, like that, that's another way to be horny. And that's important because uh, most people might not know this, but um, Abelard was castrated um, by one of his, by Eloise's uncle. In, that's right in an act of retribution so so r.i.p your penis is literal like like it was gone so, yeah. Yeah. he claims he claims that the entire city of paris wept outside his window when his got his date got cut off but i'm like citation needed homeboy <laughs> that's um, <right. laughs> so like I, I i i failed to believe it so you've got that kind of horny and yeah. then you've got like ecstatic vision oh look check it out girl you're a saint now horny so you know there's a wide like grab bag of ways to be horny and um tldr they were horny though it's not just yeah. religion sorry trad suck it yeah <laughs> there's also i mean there's an interesting thing which I, which i know eleanor and, and, and john probably know about as well is that you have um uh male writers who are writing about female saints often attributing sexuality which which isn't necessarily there and i mean mm -hmm. the great example of this is like someone like catherine of siena who's a very well-known saint incredibly popular in the later middle ages if you read her letters, which we have hundreds of, of, well, dozens of letters at least that survive from the period, like she's writing like these really deeply political letters, which is like, you know, this is during the, the great schism, like, um, mm -hmm. you know, the Pope, you need to, to leave Avignon, you need to come back to Rome, like there's this, you know, turmoil in Northern Italy, like these are the contents of her letters. And then like Thomas of Trelano, who is her confessor and her biographer is like, and then Catherine went into a trance and Jesus penetrated her several times and she felt ecstasy through her whole body. And it's just like, Jesus, Thomas, calm down, right? Like, 
you know, and, and for a long it? time, like people were like, oh, Catherine of Siena, like she's this ecstatic, you know, kind of horny saint and stuff like that. It's like, dude, like read her letters. Like she, she was fine. Like Thomas, like Thomas, Thomas be issues. horny though. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas it, it, super it. Horny. yeah. And, and like, and that's like one of the big ways that it's really interesting whenever you get into uh, women saints is that a lot of the time, the way that we find out about them is through their confessors and yeah. their confessors are a lot of the time madly horny. Um, so it's like um, Bridget of Sweden's confessor is pretty horny. Yeah. Um, you know, like the, men who are them. horny for Jesus. Yeah, a lot of them, right. or yeah. or a lot of the time they like put the women through like super like excessive mm. um, kind of penances. They'll be like, oh, you need to wear a hair short because you're so horny. And they'll be like, was I? Oh, okay, all right, I guess I'm doing this now. You know, and it's like, it comes across like very like non-consensual like BDSM. Uh, but, you know, so for example, my boy, Charles IV, he was really big in uh, bringing the cult of St. Catherine um, like into the Holy Roman Empire. He was really into her because of all of her political statements. And like, pe and he was always like, I don't buy this horny shit. And this village was like a quite a, really interesting. He was really, really um, interested in her because she said everything that he wanted her to say, which is like, no more Avignon, somebody sort out Italy. And he's like, oh, I'm somebody and et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting because there are various ways where masculinities will like kind of um, get into the way that, you know, religious women, uh, you, you know, will put themselves forward. And to be fair, like the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, less horny than this priest. So, you know, make of that what you will. Yeah. Okay. I, think I know we don't have, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Marcia, sorry. We don't have time for Matt to give a lecture, but I do have a question on all of this. Okay, so Matt, yeah, I this one thing I have tried to learn medieval history for a while. Like it's like it's offered in like seventh grade in California. I I was gonna take a class on it in college, but then I uh, gave up like a weekend. Um, <laughs> seriously, there were too many. Like, it was too confusing to me. Um, so my only question out of all of this is, what is the Great Schism? Who actually is fighting? Why are there two popes, and how does the pope become one pope? Well, let me tell mm. you. And is the pope um, horny? Yeah, the so pope, mo like the most, of, <laughs> most, most of the time, the pope was extraordinarily horny. Like, so, so that's settled. Right? Um, <laughs> the other thing, too, I want to say, like, Marcia, though, is that given the number of times, like, I have heard your uh louis the 16th blood on the face excitement story you would love the middle ages like there's like fucking blood shooting everywhere so like that's fair okay maybe try it again sometime so the great schism so the great schism is basically is is a debate that's that's a long running debate it's about like how do you make a pope and what does the pope mean so for a long time, there's there's nothing, I mean, there's, there's something kind of like the Pope, but it's basically just kind of the Bishop of Rome, which is a normal kind of ecclesiastical and civil office, which exists at, at cities throughout the, the late antique Roman Empire, in which the Bishop is kind of the, the, the leader of the Christian community in the city. The Bishop of Rome is kind of important because it's tied to Peter, the Apostle Peter and his legacy, because he winds up in Rome. He was first in Antioch, and then he comes to Rome, and that's where he's, he's martyred. And, and so he's the important legacy... because he was the guy in heaven who lets people into heaven. That's right. Well, so because this is the he, that's the only joke Jesus is known to have made, right? <laughs> I shall call you Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Right? That's right. That's right. And Petros means rock. So yes, absolutely. Oh. So, yes. Thank you, Eric. That. that was wonderful. So yes, I, you, My as, Alan Ritten Ritten says, as Alan Ritten says, says benefit to the classical right education. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> All right. So 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 this is Bishop of Rome, and, and so it's tied to Rome for for a century, like a millennia and more. Um, but in the, I think it's in the 14th century, I've had a lot of drinks, and I think that's right, the 1300s is the 14th century, is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so in the 14th century, um, so there, there's a move in which the, basically the papacy is kind of, well, depending on your, your perspective, but the papacy is kind of captured by the French monarchy, and it's moved to the city of Avignon, which is technically just outside of French royal control at the time, still within the Holy Roman Empire, but... Um, but like certainly within the orbit of the French king. And so for their own safety, they are moved there. Now, in fairness, kind of, you know, about this, this kind of capturing thing, Roman factional politics about the, within the city of Rome are like a fucking mess. Like they are killing people left and right. Popes are murdered 
all the time. So wow. like it is, it is incredibly unsafe to actually be the Bishop mm -hmm. of Rome like throughout mm -hmm. the entire Middle Ages. Cause like you have the German emperor who wants to kill you. You have the French uh, king who wants to kill you. You have Roman uh, families who want to kill you depending on kind of kind of where you come from and stuff like that. So, so they move the there. Malaria. Oh yeah, yeah and all and the malaria, malaria too, yeah, yeah. That, that whole thing. Yeah, because <laughs> Rome is built in a fucking swamp. Like, you know, yeah. that whole thing. Um, so, 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 so that happens. The, the Pope moves, you know, his permanent home to Avignon. But people say like, well, no, it, it should be the Bishop of Rome. The papacy is tied to the city itself. And so that, so certain members of the, the Roman kind of uh, uh, curia, the clerics, the, 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 the ecclesiastics within Rome, they elect their own Pope. And so you have two Popes for a long time. You have one in, in Avignon and you have one in Rome. And so that's the great schism in which people pledge their allegiance to one or the other, you know, Avignon or Rome kind of depending. That lasts for a significant amount of time, years. I have no idea because I'm on like my fifth drink, um, but it's like a long time. <laughs> and, but look, the Middle Ages is like a thousand years. So like, whatever. Um, and then, um, so they, they, they split off for a while and then they have a council and they decide they're going to make a decision. The first council doesn't really fucking work because they elect another guy. And so you have three popes then instead of just two. And then they have another council and then they kind of finally resolve it after some messy negotiations and stuff like that. This and is then, the best reality show that has not been made yet. Like, oh my I God. I don't understand. Why isn't there a prestige show about this? Like, come on. Like, yeah, they're you down. have they're 40 down. ass popes. You have like the French king. You have the Holy Roman Empire. You have Roman factional politics. You got like people all Game over the popes. place. Game of popes. Yes. Oh, Thank yes. you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Varsha. You have you have solved medieval history. Right <laughs> I mean, I just want to point out here um, that, and I'm Matt, I'm glad that you made this like distinction because I've always been Team Avignon because like <laughs> um, basically like when you look at it like the the entire the the circumstances of the election where they're like you know what no they're like no. so dodgy because it was like basically everyone like all of the cardinals were essentially like we've got to elect a roman because there was like a giant mob outside that were like i'm gonna fucking kill you if you don't like get a roman pope they like it's like elected... january 6th right like yeah, like yeah. January and they, 6th, like, right? exactly and then they were like okay well i don't know like this guy and he's like i'm from naples and everyone's like yeah close enough whatever That's and, right. then they were like, <laughs> and then the french guys were like we got to get out of here because everyone's gonna fucking kill us the like the napoleon guy they elected was like a crazy person like an out and out violent crazy person who was like threatening to kill everyone and then mm -hmm. they like flee and they're like by the way we did that because everyone was gonna fucking kill us and everyone was like no do-overs no do-overs and i'm like Nope. I just like I can't say that I think Avignon was wrong. Well, and this this comes back no, absolutely like this is this is a hundred percent accurate. Thank you, Eleanor. But like this comes back to my favorite historical heresy, which is that is about Donatism, which is that when yes. an ordination like Augustine and Donatist, like in the late antiquity, like this is I'm oh my god, I'm I don't sorry, I'm gonna go off on Donatism now. Do so, it. Like, okay, what is met. Donatism? So all right, so in late antiquity, in the fourth century, Augustine comes out against this heresy, which he calls Donatism, which is based on this, this guy named Donatus. So when the, um, right before uh, Constantine converts to Christianity, there's a great persecution of Christians and they have to, they have to hand over the books. They try to, they, they, they give over, they're called traditores. They're literally handing over the books. It's where we get the word traitors from, right? But what happens there is that after um, Constantine converts to Christianity, a lot of these priests who gave over the books and betrayed their Christian um, communities, they're allowed to become priests again, basically. They're forgiven and stuff like that. And the, the sacraments they, uh, they, they committed were still kind of valid. Obviously, he said that's totally legit because ordination is a divinely inspired thing. You can't take it back once it happens, just like Eleanor was saying. Like, there's no take backs, like, no matter what happens, right? But Don Donata said, like, fuck that shit. Those people were assholes. They got a lot of people killed. And they they should have they should be like excluded from the priesthood. Unfortunately, Donatus loses, and you know we have this this whole thing, and, and Augustine wins. Like, but fuck Augustine, like I'm yeah. That guy that. was horny for pears. That guy was. <laughs> right like you know yeah. you know like another another dude who just like shags like two chicks his whole life and then is like no one should be shagging though also i want to fuck a pair by the way like <laughs> no donatism like okay i used to think american history in the 20th century was so cool 
Um, I'm not that sure right now. Medieval studies, where it's at. Who whomst in American history has fucked a pair? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out if you have a thousand years of history to pick from, you can find some really interesting stuff. <laughs> right. you know, it's, medieval history is full of guys. It's just like a series of like finding yeah. a guy. So it's pretty good. Yeah. You know, I will say in fairness, we don't have acronyms. We don't have a lot of acronyms. Mm -hmm. That is that is something we are we we're deeply yeah. deeply missing. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I, uh, I, I do we should probably I, wrap up. I'm I'm sorry. Like should, yeah. you know, yeah, we've we <laughs> kept people long enough. This is this is a lot. So um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this has been uh, our rogue episode of um, uninvited lectures. Thank you to our guests, uh, John, Eleanor, Eric, and Annabelle. You have been amazing. I, I, I have to say, like, I, no, no disrespect to anybody here. Like, I think Annabelle's just, uh, uh, you know, uninvited lecture wins, like, for her discussion of, of the yeah. deal. Oh, 100%. Um, you know, yep. I, I totally. learned a lot in everything. Um, Eric's discussion was, was absolutely brilliant, and I learned so much about eels at the time. Um, and but, monetary you know, Annabelle, frameworks. And monetary frameworks within <laughs> eels. Like, again, like, the fish event horizon will stay with me again, like people throwing eels into the basket as they kind of pass through on their cart. Like that's mm -hmm. going to be amazing. But like the, the, the kind of like multiple choice, like select your, your acronym and these will help you thing. <laughs> like that's, that's American history. Right. So there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's it. Yeah. So, and if you want to know more about acronyms, you can buy Eric's book. If you want to know more about the middle ages, you should buy Eleanor's book. Um, and then other than that, like, please follow everybody on Twitter. Thank you guys for joining us. Have a great night. Cheers. Cheers.